We're discussing brand building and customer experience with Robert Rosenberg. He's the former CEO of Dunkin' Donuts and author of the book, Around the Corner to Around the World. I think the surprising aspect here for me is all of the pieces that underlie it. So brand is not just a marketing exercise for you. You know, it's, it, it, it represents everything that we do to go to market to satisfy the customer. It goes to store design, it goes to, it goes to staff training, it goes to every, touches every element of the business constantly. We hear a lot about customer experience these days. Share, share your thoughts on that. I think it's become a kind of buzzword, almost a replacement for the buzzword digital transformation. Any thoughts on this notion of customer experience in this context of what you've been describing? To me, it's sort of the whole ball of wax. It starts with the acquisition of the customer in terms of what will delight them and capture their attention initially. So for us, it's uh, we fortress markets. We don't just go everywhere any franchisee particularly wants to go. It goes to how we're going to design the store so people can see in and see what the, the experience is likely to be before they get there. Uh, it, it, it gets to be advertising. So we, we pay a lot of attention to, to a way to go to market. And the, the more brand awareness we build, uh, the more likely it is that people are going to try us. And then, of course, we go back to the same things that we touched on before. Once the customer is acquired, is how do you keep that customer? How do you keep them excited? You do it through product news. You do it through the trust they build and getting the same consistent product that they love and, and want uh, day in and day out all the time. And you continually take their temperature um, by a whole host of means in order to make sure that it keeps occurring. And you have to touch all their senses. And, so, and sometimes it goes way beyond that. It, it can get to be their concerns. If customers and the customer experience in, in, in our industry, what had always built it, what was the really the wind in our sails was the movement of women into the workforce. Before the Second World War, one out of three women worked in the workforce. That had grown over my 50 years of association with the brand and now two out of three women. That meant that they needed a replacement for the work that they had done in the kitchen. And what appealed to them was convenience and value. And that is all of what drives us in terms of what that means. So convenience today is digitization, uh, the ability to be able to order online, the ability to, to be able to, to, to belong to a, um, a loyalty club, uh, uh, to belong to the Dunkin' Donut brands network and make offers to that customer base and customer relationship marketing. Uh, it's a continually evolving pattern uh, where you have to keep upping your game as the consumer has more options and alternatives. You've got to keep up and make sure you're filling them better than someone else. And that creates the whole overall experience of the consumer. So what's the difference between building a brand and creating great customer experience? Well, I don't think you can really create a brand without creating great customer experience. I mean, that is the basis of why you're doing it. The brand represents something to the customer that reflects what they want and their experience in connection with the brand. So, um, I, you know, you basically have to be very nimble and you have to listen. You have to capture the zeitgeist of the moment in terms of what's important to the consumer. And that's constantly changing. Uh, basically, I broke my book down into five eras, uh, six eras, I'm sorry. Each represented a different sort of responses of strategic responses. Because in our world, in those years, uh, in some some eras maybe four years, and some were seven or years. But the customer and the competition kept changing all the time, and that required new responses on our behalf to do that. So we we were watching. So in our world, the customer and our, and and watching them were changing constantly. Their options kept changing, the competition kept changing, and we had to change along with it. And um, and that's that. That really is was the source of how, how I looked at the world today. My suspicion is the world is changing so quickly that what was five years in 1990 is now maybe three, two or three years today. You know, Moore's law is that it used to be that technology or the computerization capability doubles every two years. Well, now maybe it's every year or nine months. Maybe I mean. It's, it's telescope. You have to be even more nimble today than ever. You mentioned capturing the zeitgeist of the time. Was that 
your job as CEO and, and how did you go about doing that? How did the company go about doing that? Well, it wasn't only my job. It was everybody's job. And basically, you had to be open and listen very carefully to all inputs. Uh, I would belong to trade associations. I would go to the National Restaurant Association where I was a trustee for 12 years and see what my colleagues were doing. Uh, I was very friendly with the uh, CEOs of Tim Horton Donuts and Mr. Donut. And they were among my friends. So I would watch very carefully what my competitors were doing. I would visit uh, we went so far. They went so far as to invite me to <laughs> up to, uh, to to be the keynote speaker at, at a Tim Hortons franchise meeting in Canada. Um, we were we were close, and I watched v- very carefully. But input came from product managers. We had product managers. We had the competence of a packaged goods company. We would take attitude usage studies. Uh, we would visit stores. We would work in stores, and. Um, and it also helps to have children. <laughs> in my case, I still have a 32 year old, and and uh, I liken the fact that you know she was a Dunkin' customer. Uh, every day she would start her iced coffee with a Dunkin' product, and I and I said, you know, honey, you're not going as much, and you're going to, in New York, you're going to some other stores. She said, well, they have uh, soy milk or oat milk, or, uh, oat, oat milk, and and they don't have that in my lo- local Dunkin' store, and that would be the kind of tip off necessary to see it, to try it in a market, to see how large a cohort required a wanted soy milk or, or to, to, and, and that was the beauty of our system. We had lots of places to experiment, but we would experiment with that to see if it was large enough. And once we experimented and proved it may not have been that much of a movement, it was a very small niche market. Didn't mean you didn't go back and do it again in two years or another year because everything kept moving so quickly. And that was moving quickly. Today, I think consumers not only want convenience and value, as they always did, but they're also starting to vote on ESG, on environment, on social, on governance issues. They're starting to, to, to put their money behind brands that deliver on those concerns. So concerns, you have to up your game and you have to be sensitive to those issues as well. So the notion of measurement and getting uh, not just intuitive feedback, but very careful quantitative feedback. Tell us about that. I couldn't move four or 5,000 stores on a whim because my daughter drinks soy milk. I had to quantify and go into a test market and, and, and determine, you know, how large a cohort there was. We were very avid testers. So for example, in a new product, product news is very important in a retail business. You have to keep exciting and enthusing the customer with either new product, price, promotion, some activity. We would have product managers, some responsible for beverages, some responsible for for bakery goods, some responsible for other matters on the offering snacks. And their job was to survey the the scene across the entire width and breadth of of the competition to see what was working, listen to consumers, to get feedback from franchise owners. Some of our best ideas came from franchise owners, munchkins, iced coffee. Most people don't realize that iced coffee wasn't a product until the mid-90s. It was only drunk in the state of Rhode Island. They were the only people in iced coffee. And we decided to lift that product up and bring it to the world. And some markets in the summertime, it could be 20, 30 percent of our business. I mean, Munchkins was introduced in the midst of the gas lines of the mid of the early 70s. It's it's been a product that's been around for over 50 years. Thrilling customers came from franchise owners. So it comes from all sources not just the CEO. When you talk about listening, it's not just keeping your ear to the ground, but it's having all kinds of processes to gather that information in in structured, very disciplined ways. Absolutely. And test it before you roll it up. In our case, it's, it's, too, it's too important. For example, uh, uh, a good example might be that, that it's important every once in a while to refresh the store, called a remodeling. And generally in the trade, it's seven years. But we also had a standard that we wouldn't ask a franchise owner to invest a lot of money unless it could provide a fair rate of return. And we would be, it would ta- we would be tasked with the responsibility of finding out what it took in order to ensure that they got a fair return. So let's assume for the moment that our return standard was we wouldn't ask them to invest unless it could provide a 15% return. 
And we would scratch our heads and strive. Sometimes just putting a new face wasn't enough to do that. So we, we would have to keep working at it and working at it. In the case we had Babson students, some one of our suppliers, time and motion studies, uh, we couldn't for the life of us find a way to up the sales enough to warrant the investment of whatever it was in those years, $50,000 for a facelift. And then uh, they did a time and motion study and they found that um, when someone was passing by a Dunkin' Donut shop, if they saw in the drive through lane more than four cars or five cars or more than four or five people standing in line, there was a, what I would call a balk rate, you know, a false move. And 25% of the customers, one out of every four, would balk, would pass by and drive by to another Dunkin' store or to a competitor. So that meant the gating variable to unleash the same store sales to pay for the remodeling was either faster drive through put time by putting up the, 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 the windows that they talked in earlier in their entrance into the parking lot, audio stuff so that they could hear each other talk to fill the orders, or another register for another line. And that paid, that, that would unlock the key, but it took an immense amount of digging and pushing to figure that out. And we would not ask the franchise owners to make that investment unless we could provide that ROI, that return on investment. So you developed over time uh, a variety, numerous, it sounds like, various types of models and processes that helped you touch the or listen to use your term to what was going on with consumer sentiment at, at various times intently watch the consumer talk to the consumer measure the consumer measure the competition it's it's continuing and it's changing rapidly all the time what are the hardest challenges associated with that kind of intently watching the consumer put you to a strong test uh, uh, is to build the infrastructure to do the testing to ensure that you're not asking people to go off on a toot on the wrong idea. I mean, early in my career, I would love to tell you that at 25, when I took the company over, I was fully baked and understood all these things. It, that's not the case. It was a long journey. Uh, now in vogue is the language of emotional intelligence, know yourself and know others as well. And that, that was a, an evolving process of a lot of listening and looking. Um, so that, that, that was the way that we went about gaining that kind of control and understanding. So now you've, you've gotten this information, this data. How do you act on it? And how, to, how did you manage to adapt, manage the organization to adapt, especially as the company eventually became so large? Well, basically, a strong idea has a life of its own. So the testing was essential to all of this. And when we tested things in the marketplace, uh, if it provided the kind of returns and it was competing against other ideas, those that were sort of selected out of all of the choices and options that were available would be the ones that we would put on a calendar and unveil for the coming year. And we would mobilize everybody at this annual meeting of how we were going to market. We would communicate through every means available, face-to-face, -face, uh, video, um, audio, and newsletters, every which way in order to mobilize. And district managers and tech people in the field would work with owners in order to and the staff in order to execute on a daily basis. But it was a highly orchestrated plan how we would go to market every single year, unveil from top to bottom. Everything was calendarized out. Everything was measured. Everything was pre-tested. So it wasn't a big surprise. So if, for example, we were coming out with bagels and that was going to be the brand new product, we had to have ovens, we had to teach people, we had to spend $25 million in order to get these ovens from the UK in order to be able to provide moist heat for, the, for a better bagel. We had to train everyone. It was, a, it was like a dance all the way straight through. But before we did that, we tested it out in test markets to ensure that it provided the right return, the return before we asked them to do it met our standard of a rate, rate of return that was acceptable to them. And then the training continued on throughout by everybody in the organization. And there's only so many things you can do. So it starts with planning. So I mentioned our planning language to begin with. I said, what was our mission? What do we want to be? What do we want to have? Which were our objectives or goals? I use that language interchangeably. And then the next thing was, what are the four or five or three or five levers that we are going to pull in order to bridge scarce resources, time, money, people, 
to the achievement of those objectives. So if our objective was to, let's assume we had a, three of them. One of them was to grow earnings per share by 15, 10 to 15% a year. A second was to ensure that the franchise owner earned a 15% return on investment at the unit level, because that was the determinant of what it was scalable and in my, our view, whether or not it was worthwhile to take, take the license. And the third one was debt capacity. If one of those was to unveil a brand new product in order to drive same store sales up by three, four, five percent, that was one of the levers that we were all going to do. You can't do everything. The only certain amount, of, even a country as large as the United States, can't pull every lever. If it tries, it'll get nowhere. So you have to focus on what are the major opportunities, what are the major challenges that face the business. And that's the art of leadership in that planning process and creating that strategy. That is the test. And that's where we do that. So Let's assume for our case that we knew that if we could build same store sales by four or five percent, if we could open new distribution to the extent of two or three percent, if we could get store margins up from, let's assume, 10 to 12 percent. In other words, those four or five things that we had to do, what were the ways that we were going to take those scarce resources and aim it against those aiming points? And then we'd all mobilize behind it. And that was what I would put out in a newsletter beforehand to every member of the company. And then that was what we would tell at the annual meeting where we unveiled it. And we would then work in the field to execute against that plan. So that very disciplined execution was the heart of that business, your business. You cannot build a big business without processes and procedures. And that was the core of it. We built it on three Ps. Exquisite planning. I mean, real crisp planning. Key standardized the, la the planning language. You know, what you want to have, what you want to be, what your strategic levers are going to be, what tactics go to support each of those um, people in order to recruit and retain and motivate the best people to execute that strategy. And then third, were the best products in the world in order to woo the customer continuously. Those three Ps were how we built our business. We have a question from Twitter. How do executives justify paying for quality ingredients and input inputs when investors are demanding higher profit and lower costs? How do you balance that? In my view, you cannot get higher profits. If, if in fact, the consumer wants, and if you believe by listening to the consumer, the consumer wants an extraordinary product. And, and you know, you have to strike a balance in terms of what it is. It, it isn't purely quality to the extent uh, that you can ignore costs. There is a point at which they will not pay for that. We would price to protect margins. So it, it's a kind of delicate balance in terms of striking the right price. In our case, we didn't charge necessarily a premium price. We were providing premium product at everyday competitive prices, not necessarily against, uh, for the sake of argument, Starbucks you know, we're pricing probably 50% higher for, for a cup of coffee than we were. But but our coffee met the needs of our consumer perfectly. And we were matching what they wanted, what they were willing to pay for. And that was a, a constant look. We surveyed all the competitors every six months to see what they were paying, what they were pricing. Then within that, we would provide the best possible product available. In our case, you know, we ne in, the, in the 35 years I was there, I never remember a conversation that ever made the choice of lowering quality to save money. That was never a conversation we ever had. Just the opposite. For example, getting dairies to make 18% light cream, we thought that that colored the coffee better. The mouthfeel for fresh light cream was better than anything else. When ultra pasteurized cream was available with an 180 day shelf life, which was now going to be cheaper. You didn't have to deliver it, you know, a couple of times a week by the dairy to the store. Uh, it was going to be a, a savings. We, we would never ever compromise to do that. Uh, we would stick with the fact that we, we, we wanted fresh, not ultra pasteurized fresh cream in order to be able to color our coffee and in order to create the mouthfeel that we thought were necessary for the end product of that Dunkin' Donut product having a real clarity around your focus, your customer, what those customers want was the absolute North Star reference point. And then of course the execution to deliver that and all of the processes and everything else that, that underlies it. Absolutely. That was exactly, that's exactly how I would describe it. 
you were also on the board of Domino's Pizza as they were making the transition to becoming not just a pizza shop, but a major digital e-commerce powerhouse. Tell us about that. I had a front row seat. I was a, a, a director of Domino's uh, after my retirement for 12 years. Uh, uh, and, and the pizza business was interesting. It, it was a worldwide business. It was providing the ultimate inconvenience in home delivery. And um, it, what I, I saw there was that they were pioneering. Domino's was pioneering what I would call the third phase of the fast food industry. The fast food industry was built by lots of entrepreneurs uh, that, that created great operations of, to satisfy women joining the workforce by alternative food products and quality and, and, uh, and uh, convenience. And uh, during, <laughs> during that uh, early era, during the 50s and 60s, that was followed by the second era. The second era was fundamentally one where those companies that survived and thrived were ones that not only maintain a strong operational bent, but also added on to that first-rate consumer packaged goods know-how, uh, the understanding of following the customer, defining the customer, uh, marketing to the customer, advertising, and understanding of broadcast. The ones that were now emerging in the third phase, and that, that phase occurred, I would say, through the 80s and into the 90s. And in the 90s, it was a switch. Those companies that were going to thrive, again, kept the strong operations, kept this magnificent marketing capability and are grafting on a real clear understanding of the impact and investing in digitization. They were the ones that basically uh, started to start with point of sale registers that could track who the customer was, how often they came, what did they buy, what did they like, could form royalty. Good. So in Domino's case, what I saw was it was a worldwide business. They were growing dramatically overseas, but they weren't growing in the United States. In the United States, sales for about a decade were kind of stagnant. They, same store sales were not growing. And the pizza business was really broken down between four major chains that control 50% of the business. There was Domino's, Pizza Hut, uh, Papa John's, and, and uh, Little Caesars. And the other 50% were mom and pops, uh, local borrowers, uh, local pizzerias, where everybody had their favorite pizza. You couldn't wean them away to their favorite pizza. And that was half the market. And for years, it couldn't move. Then all of a sudden, when we introduced Pulse, our point of sale register, and we had this ability to now take online orders and do home delivery, all of a sudden, I watched 5% of the customers are ordering online, then 10%, then 20%, then 30%, then 40%. And what was happening is the mom and pops that didn't have the ability to provide that element of convenience of ordering online to their repertoire, we were now starting to get share that had heretofore always been unavailable to us. That opened my eyes personally to the impact of the digital age and what impact it was gonna have on food service. So through this pandemic, those companies that had early invested in online ordering, a mobile pay, mobile ordering, drive-through lines, pickup, uh, curbside, in order to be able to provide the customer the way they wanted to access their, their restaurant products in every platform available were the ones that were going to come through the pandemic and not only survive, but in my language, thrive when the dust clears. 650,000 restaurants in the United States, the National Restaurant Association maintains that 15% of them are likely to close. That's over 100,000 restaurants, a million and a half people out of work. That's real pain. We do need PPP extended by Washington to help those people make the transition. But I think that the existing ones that have invested both independents and chains that were smart enough and invested early enough in those ways of touching the customer through digitization are going to be able to grow better, faster than ever before. Domino's did that really well. Are there a few things that you can identify that enabled them lessons that others can learn who are going through this type of digital transforma transformation that enabled Domino's to do that well? What I find was it's a little bit of trial and error. It's hard to predict always how it's going to be. But if you are committed to the customer, and if you think that, and, it, and the customer demonstrates that convenience is important to them, then you are obliged to experiment with, with whatever means possible 
to provide that better than the competition. It's back to the same formula we talked about before. What's your purpose? If your purpose is to satisfy the customer, you're going to watch what turns them on. I, I wish I could tell you I could sit in a room and figure all that out myself. It's a little bit trying and putting a lot of hooks in the water, seeing which ones really resonate and go like hell. And those that don't, you close down and stop. And you're constantly in business. If you, Let's assume you want to grow as we did between 10 and 15% compounded in earnings per share. So we would try to grow as rapidly as we could and save some money to plant saplings. What do I mean by sapling? To try all of these options that we think have high potential with the consumer. And those that work, we expand and exploit quickly. And so do we innovate, test, and iterate, and, which is one of my lessons I contain in the book. And those that don't, we close down as rapidly as we can. And one of the tricks I've learned in that, if I had to do it again, is I wouldn't capitalize a lot of R&D uh, beforehand because it makes it very hard to back away once you've made a big commitment and you've got a lot of money riding and you've got to take a big write-off. Try not to do that. Try to expense R&D as best you can as you go along. And the second thing I learned is if you're trying to do a lot of experimentation, probably keep it on the down low until you're ready to go to market because it starts, if you're a public company, have a conversation of its own. And if it's not ready for prime time, that too makes it hard to retract and retrace. And I, I don't, can't give you a specific percentage of what worked and what didn't work, but a lot of things didn't work. We were quick to the market, uh, particularly when I was using sort of kitchen research to determine what products to be sold. I mean, I, I had watched Marie Callender pie shops on the West Coast and thought people would naturally love to go to a Dunkin' Donuts shop at Thanksgiving and buy, buy a fresh baked pie. Well, it was not true. That <laughs> wasn't the case. So there were sometimes I was way too quick to market and I had to bury some of those mistakes I made. And we developed better processes to take better temperatures of more people and do more testing before we would ever go to market. This has been a very quick conversation, and I'd really like to say thank you again to Robert Rosenberg. He is the former CEO of Dunkin' Donuts, and he wrote this excellent book, Around the Corner and Around the World. Check it out. Robert Rosenberg, thank you very much for being with, him, being with us here today. My pleasure, Michael. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have lots of shows coming up and we will talk to you soon. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>